So I'm Leo, I'm a postdoc from Zach Etienne at West Virginia University. I'm gonna be talking to you today about NERPI and how to use NERPI to generate um, ATK thorns. I uh, just wanna give a, a shout out to the NERPI team. Uh, the active members which are working on NERPI are named here. So Terrence, uh, is, uh, the, Terrence, Patrick and Tiago are all graduate students. I'm the only postdoc. And this tutorial notebook is it's going to be heavily, uh, I borrowed heavily from Terence and Patrick's work on the subject. And basically, we're going to be talking about Maxwell's equations again, so a little bit more of the same. Uh, but this time, we're going to do it in vacuum, so there are not going to be any source terms. We're going to be focusing on flat space and Cartesian coordinates, because that's what the toolkit, uh, Cartesian coordinates in particular, that's what the toolkit uses. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be giving you a three-part tutorial, uh, essentially on step one, which is what I hope to, to give. Well, there's going to be a little bit of uh, theoretical background as well, which I'm going to cover in the introduction. But basically, step zero and step one, which are going to be the theoretical introduction and actually implementing the equations using therapy, is what I'm going to cover before the break. Then hopefully, once we get here uh, to the end of part one, that will be a natural, um, you know, time to, to take a short break. And then I'll come back with how we're going to generate uh, Einstein's and uh, Maxwell's equations from, 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 from in, in C code from what we implemented using NERPI. Um, so th this is not going to cover, so th this is going to be a short introduction on NERPI now. Uh, this is not going to cover every little aspect of NERPI. Uh, there's not going to be enough time for me to you know, go very deep into what every NERPI module does. But essentially, I'm going to try to give you a, enough material so that you can learn how to use it. And if you want to learn more in depth or the inner workings of each of these modules, then you can go to NERPI's webpage, or you can, you can visit, for example, uh, the previous um, tutorial that Zach gave last year, uh, which, which covered the wave equation and, and compared how you would do it in full Python and in C, and the benefits of doing it in C, how much faster you could get uh, by using the NERPI expressions. You can also visit all these uh, tutorial notebooks, which are the, the few that I selected from the tutorial of, no of tutorial notebooks that NERPI already has. And these are the ones that I found more, most pertinent for this uh, particular tutorial. So I'm briefly going to discuss Maxwell's equations here in our particular formulation for it. So I'm going to be choosing Gaussian units with C equals to one, and the equations will look like this. This should be somewhat familiar to all the students. I just got a message that my connection is unstable. If you guys stop hearing me, please. Let me know. Uh, so here, E is the electric field, B is the magnetic field, and, and that's uh, the, the, general, the standard way that we look at these equations. But we're not going to be using this form of the equations. Instead, we're going to use the, the potential formulation of, Einstein, of Maxwell's equations, where we're going to introduce a vector potential A, Leo? which... Sorry. Leo, can I interrupt you for a me? second um, before you continue? Uh, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, how can we get access to the to this tutorial? I think Alex, you mean this one, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I actually have a, a URL here uh, that mm. you guys can access. Let me yeah. uh, uh, let me try to actually get that because I, mm. let me get this URL and paste it on the chat. That's uh, what I do recommend, though, is uh, is that you try to follow along. Uh, the discussion that I'm giving, mostly because, you know, th the way that NERPI is documented is through a series of tutorial notebooks, uh, which you can read at any time, but it's not always that you have someone actually going over what's written with you. And I might say something that might help or might confuse you, and then it's a time where you can ask a question. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. It, it also, it, you know, don't don't be worried about running the entire notebook right now. If you do run it, you're going to generate the the ETK thorn. Um, but I, I'm going to go over that later, so don't don't feel 
you, you don't have to do anything right now. So yeah, so I'm going to go over the, the, the potential formulation of Maxwell's equations that will involve using a scalar and a vector potential to change the way the equations look. There are numerical benefits to doing that. And uh, one of them in particular is both a numerical advantage and a theoretical is of theoretical use, which is that one of the ways that we are going to modify Maxwell's equations is very, very similar to the way we modify Einstein's equations when deriving the BSN formulation. And so this is going to be useful general knowledge for those who are interested in numerical relativity. Um, but yeah, so essentially the, the, the potential formulation involves writing the magnetic field as uh, the rotation, rotation of A, of a, a, an unknown vector A. And what that gives us is that the magnetic, the, the no magnetic monopole constraint where the divergence of B must be zero is automatically satisfied because the divergence of the rotational is zero. Uh, by introducing this new quantity, you see that Ampere's law, which is the, the evolution equation for the magnetic field changes in a particular way where you get now a, an evolution equation for this new vector potential A. And in doing so, we introduce this new quantity, which is the scalar or electric potential phi. This sign is just a convention. You could just as easily use the plus here. Um, and now, basically, what you did is you introduced these new quantities A and phi. But if you look at the equations now, um, you essentially have a constraint equation which is uh, Gauss law, which must be satisfied at all times. And you have two evolution equations, one for E and one for A, but you have seven dynamical fields. You have three fields here, which are the components of the electric field. You have three fields here, which are the components of the vector's potential. And you have this phi now, which is also dynamical. And so the way that we can fix this problem of having less equations than unknowns is we can choose a gauge. So you can choose a gauge, for example, where phi is constant and that would get rid of this. Or you can choose a gauge like the Lorentz gauge where you essentially get an evolution equation for phi. Uh, just a second, my cat is just annoying here. Just a second. I'm so sorry. Okay, so uh, so this is the, the the gauge of choice for us. We're evolution equations: uh, one for each component of E, one for each component of A, and one for phi. And you have a constraint equation. This is not a vector. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll fix that later. This is not a vector. This is just one constrained equation, uh, which is Gauss law. So notice that in defining it this way, where this constraint is this quantity, you essentially expect this quantity to be zero. But whether this constraint is enforced or not is, is a choice. And as you see below, we are not going to be enforcing this constraint. This is going to be using mostly as a diagnostic. Now, as I promised, there is an additional thing that we can do uh, to, 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 to justify the choice that we're going to make soon. So if you take this equation, the evolution equation for the vector potential, and you take an additional time derivative of it, you essentially get after some algebra that the evolution, that this equation is almost like a wave equation. Of course, there's this source term here, which we don't really care about now, but there is this mixed derivative term which spoils the wave-like behavior of the solution, right? If, if this were really a wave equation, you would have this on the left-hand side, this on the right-hand side, and this would be sources. But since this, this, this depends on this A and there's a mixed derivative here, it spoils that wave-like behavior. And so what we can do is we can define this quantity here in parentheses as a new dynamical variable, gamma, for example, and then we actually arrive at a wave equation. Um, it's, it, there, is, it, there is a source term here, but it's still a wave equation. Uh, 
And this particular system here, and, and an evolution for gamma can, can be easily obtained from the from its definition. So we, I, I didn't really discuss this in detail, but you can check that this is what, it, what you get. Uh, and, and this system here now is, is very, very similar to what is done to BSSN. Basically, what you have in BSSN is that you define additional auxiliary variables to absorb these mixed derivative terms and essentially get to a strongly hyperbolic evolution system. And what you gain by doing that is an additional constraint equation where now this gamma, which is defined as the divergence of A, it must be satisfied at all times. And you can use this if you're not gonna enforce it, you can use this equation to measure how well you are satisfying this constraint and how well you're satisfying Maxwell's equation. So now quickly switching to, to index notation, which I guess most people are already familiar, we arrive at two possible systems. System one uh, is, gonna, is, is not going to have, it's going to contain the mixed derivatives of A, and system two is gonna contain this new auxiliary variable gamma. I'm not gonna be too careful the, with the indices during my implementation because I am using Cartesian coordinates and flat space time. And so, you know, it, I'm not going to distinguish much between up and down indices, but it's good practice to have them in this way. Blue equations here are evolution equations, and red equations are constraint equations. And so now I'm, I'm, we're going to implement both the systems in NERPI. And the idea is going to be to create a thorn that supports both systems. Um, so the way that NERPI tutorial, so the, the way that NERPI tutorial notebooks work is that you generally provide all the, the you generally load all the, the Python and NERPI modules that you're going to need in the very beginning of the notebook. And then after that, you just focus entirely on implementation and on documenting what you're doing. Uh, so basically here, if you, if you did visit this, um, um, URL that I gave you, you see that this uh, folder that we're at does not contain um, any of the NERPI modules that are needed, but that's because this is a subdirectory inside the NERPI um, main repository. And so I'm just going to add the, the, the actual directory where all the NERPI modules are contained to the system path so that we can load all the NERPI co code that I need when, when performing this, when, when implementing the equations below. So you see that basically everything that we do, we try to document it as, as best as we possibly can. So even without knowing anything about what this module is, the module is, is somewhat self-descriptive. The, the module name is well descriptive of what it's doing. And there is a short description here of what it is expected the module to do. So basically we're gonna be needing here output C functions, which are functions that are going to generate C code from the symbolic expressions that we're going to be implemented. Our symbolic expressions use SymPy, which is an open source Python library for, for symbolic mathematics. Um, these are mostly just um, utility uh, standard Python modules that we can use. So for example, to set like paths and get the current work directory. It's not something, uh, it, it's something that should come with your Python already. Um, and then you have the, the NERPI parameter interface, um, which is going to be useful to set for setting NERPI parameters, basically, and to declare C parameters as well. Um, this, this function here will handle grids. So basically, you can access, for example, the XYZ, um, the XYZ components. It's going to be throughout this module. You can also add set how many spatial dimensions you're going to use. It's going to be throughout this module. You're also going to be using this to, de to declare grid functions. Uh, the loop module is used to create, to generate C loops. Uh, we're not going to be using this much explicitly, I think, but it's going to be required by some of the other modules. Then one key module is the index expression module, which is going to be used to, to implement vectors and tensors and index expressions in general in NERPI. There's a reference metric, which is mostly used for BSSN when writing the, the, the BSSN equations with a reference metric approach. But we're going to be needing that so that we can set the coordinate system, for example, which is going to be important in NERPI. Uh, this is a specific NERPI module that 
can be used to create directories and delete directories and, and it's pretty useful because it's, it works with all, it uses the same, same syntax for all uh, OSs. So you can use it for Mac, for Linux and for Windows. And this is just something that generates the NERPY logo once we have finished our thorn. This is, uh, it's completely optional. Of course, you don't really have to, to have that. So grid functions, um, which I will briefly overview here, are functions which are defined on the grid. So basically what you have is you have in, in, in the ETK, you have the three coordinates X, Y, Z. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a discretized version of space by introducing these stack sizes, delta X, delta Y, delta Z, and making the coordinates range from an X minimum to an X maximum, which is achieved when you, you plug in the maximum allowed value for this index I, uh, in, a, in a series of steps. So now you, you obtain a, a discretized version of space and, valid, and functions which are evaluated at those particular points are called grid functions. So there is some confusion here. The notation may be poor, but this IJK here this has nothing to do with space, spatial indices like this one here, which are actually components of the elect, electric field. It, this is just specifying where, what point you know, X, I, Y, J, and Z, K, we are the grid. Uh, but this is essentially what a grid function is. So we're gonna be needing grid functions for the electric field, the vector potential, the scalar potential, and when using the system two of equations, we're gonna need for gamma as well. Uh, so we need seven uh, grid function, evolution grid functions for system one and eight grid functions for system two. And basically you need to register these grid functions within NERP because that will allow, so if you try to take a derivative of a variable which is not registered as a grid function, then NERP is gonna throw errors at you because it's not going to be able to, to do that. It, it, you need to, to have something that is a grid function before you can actually take finite differences from it. So there is a slight distinction as to how you declare grid functions using NERP. If you're using scalars, then you must use the grid module. And if you're using index, index expressions or vectors or tensors, then you must use the index expression module. The way that we do it is that we try to make the grid function name as descriptive as possible. Uh, that's both for our own sanity as programmers, but also when other people like students or collaborators are trying to read our code, uh, they don't really have to you know, it's not that difficult to follow the code, even if you don't read all of the documentation. So essentially, uh, up, so for example, an index expression like this, where you have a, a, an arbitrary tensor M with two upper indices A, B, and two down indices C, D, would be written like this. Um, so you have an M, then two upper indices U, U, and two down indices down, down. If we use uppercase U's and uppercase D's to, to denote that that has an index, an index. And of course, if you want to access element A, B, C, D of this particular object, I forgot to actually add that, but you would have to do this. So A, B, C, D. And that's how you would access element A, B, C, D of this object. So the first index corresponds to this index, the second index corresponds to this one, and so on. Uh, also, this is not going to appear in our equations, but it's useful to mention that if you have a four dimensional index expression, such as this one, where this mu now uh, is actually a space time index, so it also has a time component, then we, we typically append a four to its name just to make it clear that it is a, a four dimensional uh, expression. And then of course this, you can access between zero and three because that's the way that indices run in, in Python. So this is how we would declare the Maxwell grid functions. Now, this is a lot to take in. This particular, uh, so this right here, I can remove for a second because it's not particularly useful if this is the first time you're seeing this. But the way that we're doing, what, what we're essentially doing here is phi and gamma are being registered using the grid module as evolution grid functions. And you basically just pass a list phi and gamma here, and it's gonna return these things. So now that we have registered this as grid functions, if we try to register them again, 
Nerpy is going to give an error. It's going to say, look, you, you already registered Pi as a grid as a grid function. I found that in my in, in the list of evolved grid functions. So you cannot register it again. And so to fix that problem, I added this uh, if statement here which is basically an if statement that loops over the grid function list and checks whether this grid function phi already exists. And if it does, then that means that I have already called this function before and it has already declared these grid functions. And therefore it just returns symbolic expressions instead of actually registering them again and no error is given. But yeah, so essentially you just have these grid functions being declared here and you have these additional grid functions here, which you, you see it's now performed with the index expression module. And you register the grid function for a single variable of rank one, and uh, we just keep the same name here. So if you run this, oops, I'm sorry. If you run this and then you, you, you try to figure out what these variables look like. So phi and gamma are just SymPy variables. Uh, which Jupyter is kindly printing here as, uh, as Greek letters, while EU and AU are Python lists of SymPy variables. So now you have this EU0 corresponding to EX, EU1 corresponding to EY, and EU2 corresponding to EUZ, uh, to EZ. NERPY does it this way because NERPY is not limited to Cartesian coordinates. We can, in fact, use any coordinate system that NERP already supports, which there's there are many. But for our sake, everything we're going to be doing here is in Cartesian coordinates. So you can effectively think of this as X, Y, Z. And the same for, for A, of course. You can look at A and it's going to be the same, same thing. So the next thing we, we need to learn how to do is finite differences using NERP. So finite differences very briefly is just approximating uh, derivatives of functions with finite difference expressions. Uh, you can obtain them, for example, by Taylor expanding expressions like this uh, and then combining appropriate terms, terms to actually obtain an expression that is, for example, in this case, accurate to second order in the step size. Uh, but from, from the point of view of the programmer, an a, a finite difference derivative is nothing more than just another uh, index expression. So, for example, you can define this new quantity, uh, lowercase p, k, i, j, which is actually the second derivative of this vector pi, and you can define it like this, for example. So effectively for you as the programmer, all that you're doing is declaring an indexed expression. However, you are, you are actually, you need to, to give a special name to that variable so that when generating the C code, NERPY knows that that is actually a derivative. So the way that you do that, so if this were just a regular uh, vector, about in this case, a tensor, just a regular tensor, you would declare this as PUDD, right? There would be this, there would be no underscore D here. But because these two lower indices correspond to the derivative indices, then you actually append this lowercase d and then come the derivative indices right after that. So doing this does not change anything from the point of view of SymPy. These, these are still symbolic SymPy expressions. There's nothing fancy going on there, but when you parse the SymPy expressions to generate the C code, the NERP is going to know that whenever you have an expression like this, you must replace this by the appropriate finite difference expression. So a very, very quick example here. Uh, let's, let's see that NERP uh, is able to do, to, to, to have this correct expressions here. These are the first and second derivatives of a scalar psi, and these are accurate to fourth order in the step size delta x. So like I said, NERP cannot take finite differences from something that is not a grid function. So we declare this psi as a grid function. I'm going to declare it like this because it's not going to be used anywhere else. So there's going to be this underscore here. I'm going to declare my rank one tensor, which is going to be the first or vector, if you are index expression, which is going to be the, the first derivative of the grid function psi. It has this underscore d to denote that the next index is going to be uh, a derivative index. Then there is the second derivative of the, the um, grid function psi. And the second derivative is symmetric under the, the exchange of the first two indices. And that's because derivatives commute, right? You can take dx, dy, and dy, dx, and that's the same thing. 
then I, I'm going to set my finite difference order to four. Now, you don't have to memorize these things. The best way to do it is to simply find any of the tutorial notebooks that implement finite differences, which is pretty much all of them. And you can just find the names of these uh, parameters and how they're supposed to be called. And you, you kind of learn by example in that sense. And here, I'm going to return to the way that output C works later in the next part of the tutorial. But essentially, what you have is you can call this finite difference function. And what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to it's going to give well it's going to generate c code for the x or the, yeah the, the zeroth component derivative of the variable psi and this is going to be the right hand side of my expression and it's going to associate it to the left hand side which is going to be a c variable which i named first underscore underscore derivative same here you're going to get the xx or zero zero component of the second derivative of psi and you're going to uh, assign that to uh, this, this C variable, which I call second derivative, I, this is just a parameter to keep the, the C code that is generated a little bit cleaner. Uh, by, by giving it this argument, what this function is going to do is return a string, and then all I'm doing is printing this string. And, and here I'm just removing psi from the list of grid functions because I don't want it there. And so if you look at the C code, the C code is not particularly easy to read. This one, you can actually figure out what's going on. So you see that it's reading uh, the, fun the grid function psi at points uh, i minus one or i zero minus two, i zero minus one, i zero, i zero plus one and i zero plus two. Then it's computing the, it's pre-computing these, um, these factors that are going to appear in the expression. So two thirds, one twelfth, five, five halves and four thirds. And then it's actually computing the finite difference right here. So you have one over dx, zero, which is delta x, one over 12, and then you have here the, the finite difference expression. So i minus two, i plus two, i minus one, and i plus one. So it's, it's not particularly easy to read these codes, but you, the, the intention is never to generate a C code that is human readable. What is important that is human readable is actually the Python code and its documentation. The C code is just highly optimized C code, which is not intended to be uh, as human readable as possible. But we can see here by just glancing at, at what the C code is doing and these expressions that it is generating the correct expressions. Unfortunately, you cannot see them both simultaneously because I'm zooming in too much, but uh, trust me, you, you can see them more or less on the same screen. So with that in mind, we are now ready to implement uh, system one and system two. And for now, we are not going to be thinking too much about the C code yet. All we're going to be doing is, is figuring out how to implement these expressions in, in NERPY. So basically, all we are interested in, interested in at, this, at this point is just the symbolic expressions, and that's it. So the way that evolution equations work, as uh, you probably remember from the previous tutorial that, um, that Joseph gave, uh, within the toolkit is that you implement the right-hand sides of the evolution equations, you store that to a grid function inside the ETK, and then the MOL or the method of line storm will actually take that and evolve it in time. And so what we are truly interested in implementing are these right-hand sides expressions. Of course, we want to make it clear that the right-hand side that we are implementing is associated with the evolution equation for the electric field or the vector potential, for example. But what we're truly interested in implementing are the right-hand sides. Um, and so this is the way that we're going to be implementing these equations above. Uh, I might want to zoom it out a little bit after I discuss it so that you can see that everything can be viewed in the same screen. But we start by declaring everything that we're going to be needing as grid functions. Okay. Uh, this EU is actually supposed to be EU, but I, yeah, whatever. This is actually supposed to be like this, but because I declared it above, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, but essentially what we have is we're declaring everything that we're going to need as grid functions. So gamma is not going to be needed here, but uh, it's easier to do it that way for, for, for now because the thorn is going to support both systems. So, so declare everything is a grid function. Um, and then we're going to need all the derivatives. So one of the derivatives that we're going to need is the second derivative of A. And notice here, like I said, that there's no distinction between upper and down indices. 
And so basically, I'm just going to declare both derivative indices as down. You don't have to, if you were in curved space, you would actually have to worry about that. You would have to lower these indices and actually add a metric component here. But uh, we don't need that because the, the metric in Cartesian coordinates and flat space is just uh, the Kronecker delta. And so it's, it's, it's trivial. We're also going to need the first derivatives of A because it's appearing here. And we're going to need the first derivatives of phi because that's appearing here. So these are the three derivatives that I'm declaring. Notice again that uh, this is an index expression of rank two, but there is no symmetry between the upper and down indices, right? If I do xx or xy, there's no obvious symmetry between yx. Uh, but this derivative here, which is the second der derivative of A, does have a symmetry because you can change xy by yx and obtain the same expression. And so that's what these are doing, that there is a, a symmetry between the exchange of these two last indices. And then we can implement the right-hand sides as straightforward as it can be. So basically, you start by initializing the right-hand side to 0. This command here simply returns you a list of zeros. And then you have a simple summation, just like you have in Einstein's notation. But it, here we are doing the summation explicit. There is no, there's nothing that will contract it for you. But this is a good way to keep you honest as well and just know your, what you're doing. And essentially here, what we are just doing is implementing exactly what's above here. So we have the right-hand side of this um, of the vector u, of the vector e uh, with an index i is going to be equal to negative the second derivative of a i. So notice that a i here, the i is on the a, and this corresponds to this first index. So this is the index that has an i, and then the derivatives of j j, and that's all that's appearing here. Same thing for the second term. It's very analogous. Now the last index is going to be an F, is going to be an I, but you could also swap these two because there is a symmetry there. Uh, now we implement the evolution equation for A, and that's just EI minus uh, the derivative of phi. That's done here. Again, we initialize it to zero, and then we just uh, initialize it to, to, to what it is. And finally, the evolution equation for phi, which is just this so it is a contraction. You could contract this separately and just initialize it to the contraction, but we do it this way here. It just you know, doesn't really make any difference. And so now, if you run this cell and you run this function, uh, this is going to be a mess. I don't recommend doing it this way. I just didn't really want to do it uh, before, and now I think it might be a good idea to do it. Uh, if you yeah, want to see, question. for example, yes. Yeah. Okay, so this question in the chat um, for the index symmetry in AU underscore DDD, -D -D, mm -hmm. how does Anerpia mm -hmm. um, know what? Uh, sorry, Alex, can you just know uh, what the indices, uh, what indices it is? So, Alex, can you maybe just speak up and, and ask your question directly? Sure, thanks. Yeah. Um, my question was, so I was a bit confused because here A U underscore D D D. So it's a symmetry one two. Does it is this one two referring to the indices? It's yes. it's affecting. Oh, okay. Sorry, then then I understand yeah. the, the issue. So, okay. so this is the zero index, this is the index one, and this is the index two. And so it's gonna be a symmetric under the exchange of one and two, basically. Okay, and it starts in zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And so if you look, for example, at the, the, sorry, that's not the name of the variable. So it's E right-hand side U here. You can see that essentially what we have, uh, it, it's probably easier if I print it instead of doing that because it's going to do the underscore in a weird way. But essentially what we have is that it already has simplified a few things for us uh, when we did it this way and this way. Uh, so maybe I can look at the one for A, which is going to be a little bit more interesting. Oh, I actually forgot to set the dimensions here. Oh no, that's correct, right? So the the when you have a zero, which corresponds to a x, this is going to be equal to minus e x or e u zero, and the x derivative of phi. So that's exactly correct. That's what we want. And if we look at the one for phi, uh, which is gonna, it's just gonna have that contraction of the derivative, the sum of the derivative of a u. Um, so that's system one. It's, it's relatively straightforward to, to do it this way in NERPI. Uh, 
Uh, and now we're going to implement also the constraint equation. So it's a little bit more of the same. We start by declaring all the grid functions just to make sure that they are defined. Then we declare the index expression that is the derivative of E. And then we simply compute what the right-hand side is. So we initialize it to zero, and then we sum the, the, the components of this object, which is the derivatives of E. And again, for, for system two, at this point, I think this would even be a, a good exercise if you want to read through this tutorial afterwards to maybe just zoom in, just like I'm doing here, and don't look at the implementation that is below and just try to do it. Because with what you learn from the, the first part, it should be more than enough for you to be able to do it on your, on your own. But essentially, this is just more of the same. Declare the grid functions, then declare, um, this again should, be, should not have an underscore. So declare the grid functions then declare the, um, uh, the derivatives that you're going to need. You don't have to do it before, you can do it, right? You can use, you can declare it just before you implement the right-hand side, that's also optional. And then just implement the right-hand sides as you would need. Notice that, for example, now you have this expression which only depends on i, and then there is a contraction here. So the sums must be done separately. Uh, so, you know, but that's just, you, you can always implement one term at a time if you prefer. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's not much more to go over here. I think this is just more of the same. And, and now we're also going to be implementing the two constraint equations. Uh, again, this should be like this. Uh, so declare the derivatives, which are appearing here, with the derivative of E, the derivative of I, and then just compute the C and G constraints. And so now the next step is, now we have all the symbolic expressions. The next step is going to be to generate the ETK Thorn. So I'm going to stop here because I think I'm a little bit over time already, and then we can return after the break and focus on that. Okay, thank you, Leo. That was brilliant. Do we have any more questions? I have a question about the, the declare all derivatives in that part. So for left hand side, this, that, this kind of name is required, or I can give it a, any name for left hand side? Sorry, I cannot hear you. Yeah, I'm muting myself. Sorry. You you mean this? Uh, no, no. The, the the initial declare derivative part. Oh, you you mean this part, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. So the letter right. so, the name. Right. So so for example, this here doesn't have to be a u. If if right. you wanted to do something like vector potential, you could. But if you do not declare it like this, it's not going to know that this is. So for example, doing it this way, you would, it would sort of be implicit that this object has an upper index and that that index is going to be the first one that you access when you access this rank three object. But this here is, is mandatory syntax in order to convert this object to appropriate finite difference expressions. So this, this is what indicates to Nerpy that this is a second derivative. But what comes before that is not mandatory. You can do it any way you want. Uh, we just do it this way because it, you know, it corresponds to the, 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 the variable that we're used to, and the u is, is, just reminds us that there's another index there. OK, so we have another question in the chat. Why do you append an underscore before some variable names? Oh, right. Yeah, th this is just to indicate, like, we're not going to be using this variable explicitly below. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It would work just fine if you remove the underscore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also like implementing these in functions is also not mandatory. I'm just doing it here because later when I generate the thorn, I'm just going to call a, a couple functions that's going to generate everything for me, but it's not mandatory either. OK, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking about how to generate the actual Einstein toolkit thorn from the expressions we implemented before. So again, this thorn will be useful for studying Maxwell's equations in vacuum uh, in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, and, and I'm basically going to be over, so this is the NERPY heavy part, right, which is going to be the very first part. 
which is where we're going to be generating the, the C functions that are actually responsible for computing the right-hand sides and, uh, and uh, of the evolution equations and to actually compute the constraint equations. So this is going to be mostly like NERPY heavy. And this part here is going to be mostly handwritten. There's going to be still some, some NERPY stuff in there, but most of the, the remaining part is going to be handwritten. Oops. So let's go straight up to the NERPY part. Um, so essentially what we do is, uh, again, like I mentioned before, we are in this, in this directory that, that contains just a couple files and uh, which I will go over soon as well. And basically what we're gonna do is we're going to be creating the Maxwell vacuum thorn. So we're gonna be creating that directory. We're gonna be creating the source directory and then we're gonna be adding all the files to that. So there are gonna be a, a few C codes that you're appearing here and there, which are, it's just gonna be basically telling you, telling NERPY where the directory is. It's nothing fancy or anything like that. So NERPY comes, so th this is basically just doing that. It's just re removing the thorn directory if it already exists and then creating it again. So NERPY comes with, uh, SIMD instruction. It supports single uh, instruction, multiple data, uh, compiler intrinsics. And so it, it has a, a few pre-compiled, um, it has a header file that contains all these instructions as NERPY would like to use them. And so basically here, we just add this to the thorn directory so that we can actually use them in the thorn. Uh, like I, I mentioned before, it's gonna be using this reference metric to generate a few additional files as well. Um, this is mostly like just copy and, and do it this way. There are a few subtleties as to when to use this variable as to true and when to use it as to false. I'm not gonna be going too much over it today because again, we're not really, we're, we're not really gonna be using too much of the reference metric infrastructure. But one neat thing that happens in NERP is that if you, if you generate a pure NERP code, the way that the grid functions are accessed is NERPY specific, sort of. It, it mimics what the ETK does in the sense that there's a macro that finds the appropriate index, but the appropriate 3D index on a 1D array, which are essentially what the grid functions are. But you can actually change that parameter in NERPY to actually say, you know, please access the grid functions as you would do it in the toolkit. And then all the grid function calls are going to be you know, toolkit style. It's going to be using, for example, like Joseph showed the CCTK um, GF index 3D. And here we're setting the coordinate system. Again, uh, this is mostly like for, you know, so that you, you see how it's working. When you call this, it sets the metric, it sets the coordinate system and it generates the files that should be in this directory. Uh, but it's mostly, you can, pretty much find this in any of the NERPY tutorials, it's gonna be pretty much exactly the same. Set the number of spatial dimensions, this is this appears everywhere. So now this is gonna be our master function for generating the Maxwell C codes that compute the right-hand sides and compute the, the, the constraint equations. So the way that this, so, so if I run this, right, th this is a little bit, so this is like a prototype for the function. It's gonna be taking a, a list of grid functions and symbolic expressions of grid function names and symbolic expressions. And it's basically in the name of the function, a brief description of the function. And when you call it, it's basically going to app append this to the body of the function, to all of them, and then put the C code that you want to generate in here and then just you know a few extra things that you want to generate in there. Now, normally these loops would be generated automatically for you. You wouldn't have to do this manually, but because the, the, the toolkit uses the specific variables for, uh, for looping, so the number of ghost zones in each direction and the local shape in each direction, it's easier to actually just do it by hand. Uh, these are NERPY specific. And again, this would be placed in there for you automatically. So if you had done this as a NERPY code, but because we're doing it in the toolkit, I'm adding them here uh, manually. And basically what this is doing is just reading additional variables from memory that we're going to be needing to, to compute uh, the right-hand size as efficiently as possible. So you see that this is an SIMD loop. Uh, and you can disable this if you're if you if you 
for some reason your compiler doesn't accept it, you can always disable this and then just change this to plus plus like you do it here with the others. Okay, so basically uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be, I, I don't like looking at C code in Jupyter. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually generate the C code and after I discuss it, and then we're gonna look at the C code itself because I think it's easier to look at there with proper highlighting and everything. But the way that you would do the C code generation for system one, for example, so this is what we're going to be doing. Our, our thorn is gonna have two parameters and only two parameters. The first parameter is gonna choose the order of finite differences that we want to use for our spatial derivatives. And we could, we could do, as many as we'd like, but for the sake of this example, I'm going to be choose, I'm going to be generating code for second order, fourth order, sixth order, and eighth order. This is and the other parameter is going to be a parameter that chooses whether we want to evolve system one or system two. So the first parameter is going to be an integer. The second parameter is going to be a string. Uh, and basically, what we're going to be doing is we're just we're going to be generating four, so eight functions to evaluate these things using the different find a difference order. And then we're gonna have a driver function, which is going to select the appropriate function call based on what the parameter file says. And so I think now it might be a little bit more obvious why I chose to generate this function as a, as a function and not just write them manually. It's because there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of code duplication if I do it the other way. But basically what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to, um, I mean, this is not strictly necessary, but I'm gonna uh, reset the, the weird function list. Oh, sorry, let's go for the right-hand side first. No, yeah, that, that, that's fine. So essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reset the grid function list. I'm gonna declare this C grid function, which is going to store the, the Gauss constraint. Essentially, this is the divergence of E, right? Uh, I'm gonna set, I'm going to store the current value of the finite difference order, just in case I want to keep that. And then I'm going to choose what finite differences I want to be included in my code. So I want a second, eighth, and the, the minimum one's going to be second order, the maximum one's going to be eighth order, and I'm going to change them two by two. And now, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop over the finite differences order. I'm going to set the finite difference order to the appropriate order that I'm right now. So first it's gonna be two, then four, then six, then eight. And then for this particular grid function, for, for this particular order, I'm actually going to generate my C code. So you, you can see that the way that this is, what, what this is doing right here is it's taking this, um, well, like I said before, it takes the name, the description, and the grid function and, list ex and expression list. So the name of the function is gonna be given like right here. So it's gonna be very descriptive. It's gonna be a maximum vacuum thorn, system one. This is the right-hand sides as opposed to the constraints. The FD order is gonna be what the current FD order is. There's a very short description of, that, of what that function does that's gonna appear in the beginning of the, of the C file. And then this is NERP specific. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm telling it that the left-hand side of the expression is going to be a grid function axis of this grid function eu0. And for now, this grid function does not exist in the toolkit, but we're going to define it later in the interface uh, CCL file. And what I want is the left-hand side to be a, a, a grid function axis of this U, eu0 grid function, and the right-hand side is just going to be the symbolic expression using the finite difference order that's already here. That's already implied when you set the finite difference order using this uh, global NERP parameter. And that's essentially gonna happen for every single grid function, right? So the phi, they, remember that the system one does not have the, the gamma grid function. And then I'm gonna call the, the master uh, function that I wrote before with this uh, grid function and an expressions list. And I'm going to append the name, the grid function to the make code define list, which I'm going to, which starts here as an empty list. And I'm going to come back later to that to explain what that does. And then at the same time, with this finite difference order, I'm also going to be generating the Maxwell system one constraints at the same as the order. Uh, and this is only going to be accessing one grid function, which is, which is this grid function C, which is going to store the constraint. Remember that analytically, we expect this to be zero. It's not going to be zero necessarily because of numerical error, but 
uh, it, it can converge to zero at the, at the appropriate rate, as we will see later on. And then I'm also going to generate that using the master function. Again, the, the, the function is the same. The, the style of the function is the same both for the right-hand side of the evolution equations and for the constraint equations. And so I'm going to do that for system one, just, just looping over. And then the same thing for system two. So you see here just the output just saying that it has been uh, generated. There's nothing fancy there. Same thing for system two, remembering now that system two has uh, an additional constraint equation. So there's C and G. And basically now there's also this gamma evolution equation. I renamed everything so that now it reads system two instead of system one, but it's pretty much the same loop. It's just going from, you could, you could probably merge those in a, in a prettier way, but I did it this way because you know, it's simpler, I think, for someone who's looking at this for the first time to figure out what's going on. And then there are the constraint equations as well, and everything now is generated. So um, I think you can only see this. So wait, let me stop sharing this for a second, because otherwise you won't be able to see what I want to show you. Um, let me do desktop one. That's probably the best way for me to show you this. OK, can you guys see my terminal screen? Uh, Hello? Now we can see your terminal, OK. Um, okay, cool. Could you make the font a little bit larger? It's very small. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just my old larger. eyes. <laughs> Does anyone know how to make that larger? I am not sure how to do it. On a Mac? Try just to zoom, yeah. like you would zoom on your browser. Like your window There's also smaller. a menu button. <laughs> Command the job. Uh, Command the plus, maybe. No, make the window Command smaller. Plus. Command but plus. it's full screen. Oh, yeah, there you go. Command plus works. OK. You guys can see it, right? Yep, that's perfect. OK, cool. OK, so I, I have, uh, I, I didn't go over everything that is in here yet. Uh, but if you run this generate, so th this is in Nerpy tutorial. I'm going to be giving you the link to, to access the, you know, how you could generate this in your own computer or cluster if you want. But essentially, by running this, what, what's going to happen is you're going to be running the, both the, the tutorial notebook that you guys have been looking at and an additional Python form that generates the initial data form, which we keep separate in NERPY. Uh, and basically, at the end of this execution, which is just going to take a couple, uh, like a minute or so, you're going to be ha you're going to have both the Maxwell torn and the Maxwell star, the Maxwell vacuum torn and the Maxwell vacuum ID torn, which is the evolution torn and the initial data form. Um, so yeah, this, the second one should be even quicker, I think. But essentially, what I want to show you now. Uh, is if you go into the maximum vacuum thorn, uh, let me do like this so you guys can see it. So these are all the finite difference expressions that have been generated. So if you look at this code right here, for example, oops, I forgot to do control C, and it might be hard to read it. So essentially, you see that this is what we appended manually. To the function, there are all these includes that we have appended manually. Uh, here is the short description that we gave it. Here is the function name, and then after this, we added the body of the function, which came as a function call to the output C, and this is what it's generating for us. So you see that it expects these grid functions to exist within the toolkit, I grid function, for example, or EU zero grid function, U one grid function. But it's accessing everything as it would in the toolkit, except that normally in the toolkit we use IJK. Here it's using I0, I1, I2, because that's the NERPY convention. We could replace that, but I didn't bother to. So it's very complicated to read. This is the second order example. And you see that it's very, very complicated to read. Uh, and in the end, it just, you know, it's doing all sorts of things to keep this uh, very, very efficient and very, very um, fast. But it's, it's not very human readable at all. But the important thing is that it's easy to understand, or it should be relatively easy to understand, the Python code that actually was responsible for generating this file. Uh, and you see that it, a lot of these files were generated for us. And then now what we're going to be needing is a driver function that will select which of these we want. So like I said before, the driver function uh, is, is written manually. Uh, there's also this one, which I'm not going to go into much detail on, but it's just 
a function to initialize all the right hand sides to zero. You can do all sorts of debugging with these things, so it, it's always useful to have. But I'm not going to go over in detail because it's, it's much simpler than the other cases. So the right hand side driver function, uh, which I'm writing here, uh, it, it might not be too bad to read it here in, 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 in Python, but I'm, I'm actually going to, to open it up here. Uh, I forgot the name. Okay. You guys can read it here now. So basically, this is like a very simple function. Oh, God. Okay, there you go. And what it does is it just, so this, this is something that might be useful to, to, to just say to those who are not very used to, to the toolkit or are learning this for the first time. This CCTK arguments, when it appears inside a function as the argument of the function, this is usually a function which is called by the scheduler. It's not always the case, but it, as you see here, I am actually calling one that it's uh, there, but this is, it's a useful way of uh, thinking about it. And when you do this declare CCTK arguments, basically you are loading up all the grid functions. Uh, so if you declare the grid function that says my grid function, after doing this, you can actually access that array with the name my grid function. And the same thing for the parameters, you just do that and then you have access to your parameters. And basically here it checks whether we are looking where whether we want to look at system one. If not, we do system two. And if not, it errors out because there's no other system which is reported by this storm. And then the same thing, like let's say we selected system two, it goes over the FD order one, sorry, FD order equals two, equals four, equals six, equals eight, calling the appropriate function whenever it finds it. Uh, and if it doesn't find any of these, it again, errors out because it's not supposed to, it only supports these orders. Um, this is mostly co-designed. There are, I'm sure there are better ways of doing this. This is just one particular way of doing it. Um, and the same thing for the, the constraints, right? It, it's the exact same function essentially, it's just uh, replacing the constraints, uh, uh, you know, the, the function name so that it, it, it computes the constraints at the appropriate order and errors out if nothing is happening correctly. Another thing that is important is to register uh, the evolution grid functions with the method of lines. So this is very similar. I think uh, Yosef gave an even uh, a much better uh, description of this than what I'm going to be giving now, but essentially all you're doing is you're registering the evolution groups, which again, maybe, maybe I should start by looking at the interface files because these are not obvious as to why they are defined that way. But this is the interface file for our thorn. There, there's a bunch of things here that you don't really need to worry about. The, these in the beginning, like, like, like Josef says, basically you just start by declaring what thorn you're implementing here and what parameters and, and, and what, what do you plan to interact with with this thorn. Then there's a bunch of functions that you're going to be using that are defined elsewhere, and you're just you know putting their prototype here so that they are accessible to your thorn. But here's where you are actually declaring inside the toolkit now what are the, the grid functions that you're going to be needing, right? We're going to be looking at how this is generated later, but uh, it, this is mostly by hand. I think. Uh, but the way you you see you, you now have these groups just like you had in in Yosef's thorns for the evolution variables. The evolution variables right hand side and the LCDR variables, which are the, the constraint variables. Um, and so basically, this is just saying that you know this uh, this group is going to contain the the evolution variables. This group is going to contain the right hand side variables, and you can just register them with the MOL. This is very standard with any uh, evolution thorn. You can again just copy and paste this. There's nothing fancy here. Um, the next one is it, it sets symmetries. Uh, this is mostly to use with the card grid 3D thorn. If you are looking at this, you can click here and you you be redirected to the thorns documentation. That might be useful to you. Uh, and and this basically is just going to set whether the grid Five function minutes. is even or odd uh, when you you know reflect among the x, y, and z uh, axes. Uh, it's not particularly interesting. So the, the, the C code, the, the Python code itself, it, in my opinion, it's harder to read than what the function actually looks like. So we're just going to look at the C code. Um, but essentially what it's doing is it's just setting the symmetries, right? It, 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 it always assumed that the function is a scalar, 
And then based on the grid function name, it actually sets the appropriate symmetry as to whether it's even or odd. So for example, this is, um, this is an, a vector, uh, the x component of a vector, and so it's odd in x. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, and, and so it, it's, it, it always assumes a scalar, basically something that is even, and then it changes the appropriate component. This is essentially what, what that Python, that, that code, the chunk of code, Python code is doing. So it's not very interesting, but uh, that's essentially what it is. Um, then comes the boundary so condition <clears throat> Yes. This is the old style way of defining symmetries in characters. I think yeah. a long time ago, probably more than 10 years ago, we switched to a new style where we describe what actually tensor type something is, whether it's a rank two, rank three symmetric tensor or something. And that allows to apply other symmetries as well. For example, rotation by 90 degrees, by 180 degrees and so on. Okay. And this current code does not allow to do that yet. Yeah. Yes, so the original name of the file was old CCT, and uh, sorry, it was like underscore old card 3D, uh, but that's, uh, yeah, I, I just copied that basically. <laughs> I thought it was easier to do it this way, but maybe it was not the most illuminating one. But yeah. Uh, then comes the boundary condition registration. Uh, so there are two, two boundary conditions registrations that we do. Uh, I don't really remember their names. Oh, there's only this one. Oh no, there, there's this one and there's the new rack. So there are two types of boundary conditions. Um, so yeah, so th this one is very similar to what Yosef was doing in his code. It's not particularly interesting. Uh, you can just, uh, I think, I think he's, he described this already, so I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. And the other boundary condition that we have in the code uh, is this one, which allows the code to interact with the new rad uh, thorn and basically apply Sommerfeld boundary conditions, which are radiative boundary conditions, right? You assume that the fields are outgoing waves at the boundary, and they have a, a, a specific value at infinity, and they fall off with a particular power of one over r. Uh, and basically, this is what it's configuring. It's Two minutes. The fields are like that. Uh, yeah. So that's it for that. Um, the next function simply prints the NERPY banner. It's nothing particularly interesting. And finally comes the CCL files. I, I gave it a brief description of what it is, but essentially what the make code define file does is it specifies every single source file that must be compiled, right? So this is basically just a list of the source files in your code, in your form. Nothing particularly difficult to write. The parameters, like I said before, our parameter file only contains two parameters because uh, those are the ones that we actually need. Uh, so the parameters that we have is the FD, which sets the finite difference order and which system we are we want to evolve. Uh, and perhaps the most difficult one, which I won't have time to one go minute, over in too much detail, conclude. is the schedule. But I'm sure if you compare this against what Yosef explained in the previous tutorial, you will be able to follow along just fine. Uh, and finally, uh, I just wanted to go over a couple of the results that we have. So I have already discussed this for this particular thorn. So this is a, res a result comparing what the solution of an evolved um, initial data looks like against the- 30 seconds, the, please conclude. Uh, exact solution, basically that's all that it is. And showing that we have the expected convergence rate for both of them. Also that the constraints for system two converge at the expected rate, while the system one it doesn't because there are zero speed modes in system one, which make the which make it undesirable to perform actually actual evolutions. But yeah, I have all the the description here of how you can generate this. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me later. Yeah.